Awesome. And we have uh, Sina Erdensvard, the CEO and founder of Ubico, speaking on securing online identities with simple, secure, open standards. Uh, let's give a round of applause to Sina. Thank you so much, everyone. This day is a great day for internet security. This is from today's news with uh, VentureBeat. And the news headline says, W3C approves WebAuthn as the web standard for passwordless free logins. We are very proud, the team at Ubico, to be a leading contributor behind making this mission happen. It is a big day for internet security because it is the single largest internet security problem that we're addressing. Oops, that was wrong. So, we're all here to secure the internet. But of the number one problem is a hacked online identity, followed by on old, unpatched software, and only 10% of the remaining hacks are due to any other cause. So an open standard that actually address this problem can do a big impact. I founded a company 12 years ago to help make this happen. At the time, I had no idea that I, 12 years later, would be standing here and telling this story. I just wanted to help. If you have any questions, this is the way you can submit them. They uh, will leave, the presentation will be about 25 minutes and there will be 10 minutes to, for questions. And I have some technical expertise with me here so that you can go super deep if you need. So, I continue to go on the wrong side here. So I'm just gonna tell everyone my story. I have a background in industrial product design. I'm not an internet security expert. But I have a passion for the internet. The first time I logged into the internet, I was struck with something that would probably best be described as a spiritual experience. Here's this place where we're all connected, where we, all of us can tap into the information and share. But it's clear that the internet was not designed for security. It was designed for sharing. And I learned that hands-on the first time I registered for an online bank. The bank said I would be secure with a username and password and a software that I downloaded on my computer. But I happened to know a former White Hat hacker who said it would take him one day to write the code that would empty my bank account. So to uh, inform the bank about this security risk. I called up this customer service and uh, I got a very clear response on the other side of the line. Can you please tell your friend to not do that? <laughs> so what I didn't tell the bank was that the former white hat hacker was also my husband <laughs> and the father of my three children. Uh, we started dating when I went to industrial product design school. He had just left um, college. Uh, he dropped out of college because he, he was a hacker and had too much work to do. I assume all of you already know that. Uh, he built a working prototype of one of my designs. Other young men had given me d dinners and flowers, and I knew this was my man. We started collaborating. We started companies, and we wanted to address this problem. So I asked Jacob, what could he not hack? If he could hack this software and this username and password, what could he not hack? And he responded, he could not hack a smart card. And I said, why isn't everyone using a smart card? What's the problem? Why isn't my bank using it? And he said, well, because they're so difficult to use. They're, they require drivers and client software and a CA model, and they were not designed for the web, and they were not designed for mobile. 
So I called up the bank again and said, is that true? Is that true? You, won't, you don't have good security because it's too difficult. And they confirmed he was right. And they also confirmed that the single biggest problem they saw was actually the driver and the client software, because all their users were sitting on different computers and phones, and, and there was not one unified platform. So the support cost was massive when they tried to, uh, to, to deploy these smart cards. And then I asked Jacob, hmm, the driver, a client software, why, why do we need that? When I plug in my, com my keyboard into my computer, I don't, I don't need a driver. And with that simple question, Jacob responded, well, let's invent a smart card-like thing that identifies itself as a keyboard. So we don't need any drivers. And so we did. So we called this invention the YubiKey. And it had a bold mission. It would be the next generation smart card that would enable you to have one single key to any number of services. And it identifies this as a keyboard, so it's super simple. You just touch it, and it generates a long, complicated, encrypted passcode through the keyboard interface. You don't need any drivers. But no one really cared, not even the bank. When I went back to the bank a third time, they said, oh, that sounds like an interesting invention. Can you come back? Uh, we would be happy to try that out. When you tried it somewhere else with at least 50,000 users. Oh, God, I don't know. So this one, this stair, you may know where it is. It's actually just around the corner. It is at the RSA conference. It's an escalator. And this is back in 2008, 11 years ago. I had started my company with this bold mission, but no one really cared until there was an uh, internet other internet security company who said that they want to license my technology. I arrived at the RSA conference with the hope that we together would present this as joint partners. I would have a press release, a nice booth, and the day before I, I arrived at the conference, they actually changed their mind. And there I was, the biggest internet security conference on the planet. No customers, no money. A little bag with 50 prototype YubiKeys and a business card. And it looked really bad. What I've learned as an entrepreneur is that when things look really bad, that's often when the biggest blessings could arrive. And so it did. A very clear thought came to me. OK, I don't have anything, but I have a key. And there are journalists here. And I think they may be interested in writing about this invention. So I walked up an escalator. And at the top of an escalator, I jumped into a security podcaster. His name is Steve Gibson. And two weeks later, he went out with a podcast saying, I was at the RSA conference. It was a really bizarre thing. At the top of an escalator, I met a woman. And she had this key. It's a super cool key. It was the coolest new product at the show. So there we had the launch of the YubiKey. And I'm going to share a couple of stories. We started sending out these YubiKeys with free open source servers across the globe. Steve Gibson's customer, readers, listeners were our first customers. And I'm just going to share a quick story about the sysadmin from a university who sent an email heading, my dog just ate a YubiKey. <laughs> Please advise. <laughs> that was the most fun email I ever got. Um, but I did respond, uh, if it's not a very small dog, you're probably going to be OK. And no YubiKeys, no animals were harmed. The other email that had the biggest impact for this company and for this new global standard I eventually will tell you about was from Google. It was a security architect and engineer at Google, had started buying a few keys, had implemented them. And he wrote an email like, awesome something. Uh, what is the quote for sending this out to all our employees? That's when I wrote my first business plan. 
We were 10 people at the time. Uh, we had no big sales force. We had no money. We had no, really basically no investors. Uh, no one actually really cared, but Google cared. So I'm going to move to Silicon Valley from Stockholm. I bring hus my husband, Jacob, my three kids, and we're going to work with Google and Facebook and all the internet companies to figure out how our technology can solve their problems and eventually not only their their employees' problems, but their end users' problems. We're going to develop the next generation YubiKey together with these people. We don't have to be everywhere. We just have to be in Silicon Valley, and then eventually we have to be in Seattle to figure out what this, whatever this is. And I continue to write, go the wrong way. So that is Silicon Valley. That is Silicon Valley. And a year later, uh, we launched U2F together with Google. No, we actually didn't launch. We signed a partnership a year later with Google to develop U2F, Universal Second Factor, that's based on the YubiKey invention with a new protocol that we co-created with Google that allows you to have one single security key, like a YubiKey, to any number of services without any shared secrets. So this is turning the whole model of identity upside down. In traditional single sign-on, you have a single sign-on service that where you can go to to access everything, like your Facebook Connect, your, your G Suite. With this, you actually have a key that you can sign up to any service, including a single sign-on service, a password manager, your government, your bank. But there is no secrets shared about, uh, between these services. So after we launched with Google, we, I'll let this, just before we launched with Google, we actually contributed this idea to a standard organization named FIDO Alliance. And then we got a lot of, lot of other services making support for it. We provided free open source servers, free technical support, and guidance for anyone who makes, want to make support for it. And there were, and we also enabled our competitors, any other company who wanted to build these products. There was reference code available. The one that I'm really excited about, the two I'm most excited about this was actually GitHub. When they made support for YubiKey, their vote, their community voted U2F support to be the number one most wanted feature in Mozilla. So now we had another browser that was in the process of making support for it. Because the secret that Jacob and the security engineers at Google had figured out is that we didn't need any drivers or client software. We can go with, use public key crypto if you make support directly into the browser. But we needed five companies on the planet to make that happen. We started with Chrome, now Mozilla was on. Uh, I was also, I like the way Facebook made support for, you, for, for this technology. Because they said, hey, at the end of the day, it has to be simple. So I, we don't, people don't want to bring up their keys every time they log in. They're just going to register the key. They're going to authenticate once, and that's it. They bless their key with their computer. So you don't need to bring up your key every time. It's sort of like the root of trust, the f first you, you, you register it, and then the computer and the key and the service knows that it's all connected. God, I continue to go the wrong way. So a couple of years later, Google put out a study where they had tested this technology for two years, and it was the best authentication investment in history. They had not had one single account takeover through phishing. They had been able to su reduce support with 92% of a single simple fact. So instead of having one key that you log into, one phone, one token, they gave everyone three keys. Because whatever you have, you're going to lose or break or reset what you have. And if but you have three, you got a backup and they saved more than $70 million with that. Also, it never broke. When this news report came out, Microsoft became clearly interested. Microsoft 
joined the Fido Alliance, and they said, we like this concept of a key that can work, protect phishing at scale with any number of services, but we don't want to combine it with a username password. We want to combine it with something, whatever, so we can scale it to more use cases. It could be a single factor, it could be two factor, it could be passwordless, it could be a biometrics. And this U2F then eventually became FIDO2. That was the passwordless promise. God, I don't know, I'm clicking in the wrong way all the time. So, this is one slide comprising what is WebAuthn that was launched today. It is U2F and FIDO2 comprised in one standard, and it is designed for the web. If we start with the first invention, it's used in public key crypto. Public key crypto has been used for decades. I mean, it, it, smart cards was launched 40 years ago, and it's super good to protect against phishing and man in the middle. But with all the drivers and client software and the complexity it has been in the past, this was not possible to scale. So at least we go with something we knew is good. And why is public key crypto so much better? Public key crypto is a tighter integration between the service and the user. It doesn't send like a one-time thing that could potentially be hacked. It doesn't also require one single database that can be hacked. So it's proven to be good, but historically it was complex. We also added a new feature where you have to touch it. No, actually, the new feature was a region-bound keys where you, if you sign this up for a site, the, the, the key saves the URL to that specific site. So you cannot be tricked to go to a false website, which is the number one biggest problem today with account takeover, these phishing scam emails. And then we had the user presence. The user presence requires you to actually touch it. You cannot be a remote hacker or a, trying, or a Trojan sitting somewhere else. You have to be a physical person by your computer. And then the invention that Jacob came up with. One key, any number of services, no shared secrets. It's designed for privacy and for scale. There's not one single big brother mega company who sits on your identity, on your personal data. It's a distributed system. So we started with a username password with a key, uh, together with Microsoft and the FIDO Alliance and the W3C community, we have added more options. So a key could be a smart card or a ring or a chip that you build into your computer. It doesn't have, it, it has to be some, some kind of hardware, <laughs> but it doesn't have to be an external key. It could be a built-in key. And then you combine that with some other factor. It could be a password, a pin, a touch, uh, a voice, uh, the range of whatever you believe is easiest for you and have the, the best user experience for that use case. And then the third most important thing, this is today on track to be supported in all leading platforms and browsers, including Apple. And that's why it had to move or expand from FIDO into W3C, because that's where all the big browsers are, are developing the standards that they agree on. So here are three sample use cases where you can use WebAuthn today um, to log in on your MacBook with a touch, to log in with a finger on your Android phone, or a YubiKey on the back of a phone. There are a lot of others, and there will be hundreds of more products and services eventually everyone on the planet and every service on the planet will in some way touch this standard. And a lot of people come to me and say, hey, why do we need a hardware authenticator? Why did you do all this work? 11 years developing a standard eventually will be built into all computers and phones and your products may not be needed. And I said, yes, that is perfect. Our products will 
we live together with the built-in computers because some there will be legacy computers. There will be um, situation where you actually may not be able to 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 move your your login from one computer to a phone, and there will be situation when you want that root of trust to not be tied to your computer or phone. Or you may need a backup because you lost your phone, and how would you then be able to log in? We are here to help this standard to grow to as many people and services as possible. So we are very excited that this is now being built into computers and phones. And this picture just shows that this is not new. Someone said the other day to me, why Another thing, why hardware? Isn't hardware dead? I can assure you, there is no other identification technology that is as widely spread as hardware. You see it in the chip, the chip you have in your computers, the chip you have in, in, your, in your passports, the SIM cards you have in your phones, in your driver licenses. This, and why do we have this chip? Why do we have a SIM card? Because there is no other more simple and secure way to distribute and also revoke credentials. So this is the same model. It's the same thing that FIDO2, FIDO U2F, and WebAuthn is based on. It's based on a hardware chip, but what we have developed together with this WebAuthn FIDO community is the next generation. The next generation smart card that can scale beyond these use cases. And I'm just going to end with a perspective of what happened 60 years ago. 60 years ago, there was no seat belts in cars. And people died, like flies on the highway. No one had designed the car for security. And there was a guy, he was an inventor at Volvo, who invented the three-point seat belt, and invented it with the the, by addressing three questions, if security is going to scale to a lot of users, it has to be simple, it has to work with one hand, and it has to be an open standard. So he went up to the Google, no, to the Volvo board and said, this invention should not only be for Volvo, it should be for the whole world. Let's give it away. Let's have every car on the planet have a seat belt. And so, Niels Bolin, who was the inventor, after that he saved, helped to save millions of lives. And this is the same situation we have with the internet. The internet was not designed for security. But if you, we come together and drive standards that are easy to use, that works with one hand, that works within a second, and are taken into an open standard, and then we educate the world on this standard, and then we continue to develop the standard, and we, may, and we make it an open standard so everyone can compete and come up with even better things. And eventually, we will have the government requiring us to use this, to have a little beep when we don't use it, like we have in our seatbelts. But that's, that's where the internet security is going. Web often addresses the single biggest problem we have on the internet today. Hacked credential. It's not the only problem, but it's a really good start. And if you want to help to make this movement happen, if you want to compete with us, if you want to build products, drive adoption, here are our resources. We have um, there a W3C, you can read about the spec. We have free open source service available on GitHub, technical support. Uh, we offer free technical support for those who sign up for a developer's program. And I can share a cool story. There's a, a guy, another entrepreneur I knew, who sold his company, and he was very lucky. He got a big check for that company. And he was using YubiKeys with U2F, and he was upset that his bank did not have the same good security as his, use, he has his Facebook and his Google. So he called up the CISO of that bank and said, if you don't make support for U2F, FIDO2, WebAuthn, I'm going to move all my money. And that was a lot of money that the bank didn't want to lose. And now that bank is making support. So you will see that later this year. You can do the same, whatever, whatever method you have. 
Uh, this is just a big thanks from some of the people who, who've helped make this happen. It's my team. We're 170 people. We were 10 people who landed here in Silicon Valley seven years ago. We've worked with the global internet security, internet standards community. We are very honored and blessed to be part of this, uh, to make a small but important detail in the scope of internet security. So thank you. I have now 10 minutes for questions. Any questions? No questions. One question. So I know when Google announced their Titan key, there was some dust up over wireless servers and support of Bluetooth versus NFC. Um, and I'm just wondering if where things have happened in the last six months with that. We actually developed the first reference design for Blue. OK, so someone asked about um, uh, Bluetooth. Uh, a half a year ago, Google announced their own version of a security key, which also included Bluetooth, so you can use it with an iPhone. And we, a year earlier, we actually had developed a similar prototype. We contributed those specs to the uh, FIDO Alliance, but due to security, usability, and durability aspect, we did not feel that that was the best product to put out on the market. We, instead, we uh, initiated the work on the Lightning Key. Uh, I'm not saying that the Bluetooth is completely bad, but it did not meet the security, usability, and quality aspects of what our company want to put out there. So uh, unfortunately, it was, it was the solution that was easiest at the time, um, but given that Apple had not at the time opened up for this, but now they are engaged in this standard. So uh, in the future, Lightning will work, Bluetooth will work, USB-C may work. We don't know where, where I mean, Apple have made support for USB-C with, with um, their iPads. Uh, and hopefully, which is my preference, is NFC. NFC is such a simple and clean solution. It's already used for payments and access control over the planet. So just tap a key against the phone is sort of the, the most natural user experience. So I hope one day that Apple open up support for, for external keys too. Um, that's, that's, is that the answer to your question? Yes. <laughs> yes. Have you given any thought about wearables like uh, Apple Watch or any other watches? I mean, there's a lot of cool gadgets coming out now that, you know, there's a ring, there is earrings, earrings there's bracelets. I mean, Ubico, right now we're focused on keys that you hold in your hand and put on your keychain and plug in your computers. But there's a lot of other companies who are, are, are experimenting with form factors. And we may even go there somewhere in the time. You know, um, I am convinced as this standard moves forward, you will see it in watches, in um, other kind of gadgets and things that you carry, other computing devices or uncomputing devices that you carry on yourself. Thank you. Yes? What is the lifetime of a YubiKey, and, and what is the process from migrating to one generation to the next? So we put out our first YubiKey in 2008, and we have still users who use it. That's 11, 12 years old. You know, we, we, as I told you, the story about the dog, so it does survive a lot of hard environments. So in general, YubiKeys does not expire. Uh, the only challenge with our keys is that we put new features on them all the time. So a key that you bought in 2008 does not work with this new standard. This new, you know, the FIDO U2F, FIDO 2, um, W3C standard. So that's the only downside, that their keys we put out in the, in, in the past um, will not work. But any U2F key will work with FIDO 2, with WebAuthn standard. Was that the answer to your question? So, so you don't have a rated lifetime? No. Okay. It works forever. We want it that way. Because in other ways, it's just support hassle. And we don't want people to not be able to log in. So we, we made it in a super robust plastic. There is no um, moving parts. It can be run over a car. It can go through the washing machine. We decided to make it strong. Yes. Or a dog. Or a dog, yes. <laughs> or a dog, yeah. OK, any other questions? Yes. 
Yes, he did. Uh, they, he, he, the sysadmin at the university said he, he washed it and it worked perfectly fine. <laughs> yes? Will FIDO2 ever work with SSH? Um, that's a super technical question that, Jared, can you take that one? <laughs> yeah. Hello. Um, I'm Stina's tech support. <laughs> um, it's, um, you know, we've, we've Put it to the SSH. Um, um, we, we've talked to them. I think it's it's in discussion on how we want to evolve it. If you've got ideas on how to try to move keys, I and mean, part of it is just you know storing a bunch of public keys, and it's not really set up to do that exactly the same way. Uh, you can you, you understand sort of the same model as trying to do um, the standard um, server based authentication. So I think it's just some infrastructure things. In, we wrote some sample frameworks, uh, but I think we need more community support to get that through because it's not resounding like we want it. Most people still keep with the cert base off. Hope that answers the question. So on that question, there's a lot of cool things coming out of this. There, are, you know, a version of this is being discussed for servers. Um, all the leading credit card companies have joined. Uh, and there's discussion around the next generation payments built on payment in the browser where this protocol is being used as a, as a next generation pin on chip. Uh, there is also discussion around IoT. The same protocol could be used for IoT, for cars, for whatever. So yes, there are all good questions about how can this technology continue to evolve? How can we make it better? Where can it go so we can continue to pr protect even more people? And use cases. Yes. Oh, into humans. Do we look forward to embedded chips into humans? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> it sounds painful. Um, I, I think this is, there will be choices. I think there are some people who may actually want to have it embedded and they never will lose it and they're fine, just like some military services have. They you know, implant chips into arms. And um, I think there should be choices. I hope that we don't live in a world where that's forced into all of us when we are born. You know, that would be scary. Any other final question? I don't know how much time do I have left? Five minutes. So if we could take more questions or we can move forward to the next thing. No more questions. Fantastic. It was a true pleasure to be here today. Thank you. Thank you.